everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening at our monthly Eye on Asia series. This session is um, actually a talk under our Eye on Asia initiative. Eye on Asia is a collaborative effort by the National Library Singapore with partners such as Enterprise Singapore, Business China and International Trading Institute at SMU to provide resources for everyone, including young Singaporeans who wish to find out more about the region and explore internationalization opportunities abroad. Focusing on ASEAN countries, China and India, including emerging cities, Eye on Asia offers an overview of useful resources to help you be more aware of developments in these countries as Singapore gears itself for the future economy. Tonight, we have invited Mr. Jesher Loy, Director of Branding and Marketing Development and the third generation business owner of Yakun International to share with us on Yakun's journey of internationalization. Jesher oversees the branding elements of each outlet and ensures their brand consistency. He is also actively involved in Yakun's regional expansion strategy. In addition, Jeshia is also involved in the classical music scene among the youth and strives to use the business for social good. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jeshia Loy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, thank you everyone for being willing to spend your Thursday, very precious Thursday evening with me. Uh, I'm very humbled and honoured to, 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 to share this evening with you and to have you as my audience. Uh, it's my challenge to make sure that you learn something, you take something away. Um, but I think as the topic goes, internationalization is very big. And as you well know, um, Yakun is pretty much stronger in Asia rather than in uh, you know, North Asia or even in Europe. So, so my, my, what I try to craft tonight is to share from my perspective and, my, and our journey as a Yakun, as a, as a homegrown company. And then if you have questions, or firstly, if you can relate how you can take the lessons away relating to your own personal questions of your own challenges as you internationalize, great. If not, then um, during the Q&A, which will buffer ample time, then you can ask me pertaining a particular market, say Myanmar, Vietnam, whatever. So, so rather than I go through every country and it becomes very laborious, I think what I do is I give you my own journey and then um, you can then ask the questions to contextualize to yourself, okay? Very, very... Uh, uh, also, there are always two ways of doing this. Uh, it's really up to the crowd how you want to respond. Um, one way is I can finish all the slides first and then you can you know, pound me with questions later and I'll always do my best or you can just interject along the way. You know, feel free. Uh, I, don't, I don't swing either way. It's fine. Uh, we just take it as it comes. All right, maybe, maybe that way then we can see how it goes. Okay, um, uh, uh, before, we go, we, before we jump right into um, the... So basically, the, 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 the gist of the message will cover a bit of the background again. You always need to know the, the roots, right, before you can, you can then go out. And I'll share with you why the roots are so important to us also. And then uh, we'll touch a little bit about the, the business as a whole and, and uh, our journey outside of Singapore. And then uh, lastly, a little bit about digitalization. I think that's a very big topic. You know, everyone's always asking about that. Um, I'll share with you a bit about our struggles and our, uh, how, we got th how, how we deal with that. Still dealing with it, we, we never um, mastered it yet. And then uh, uh, we'll wrap it up with, with Q&A and things like that, okay? Um, all right, so um, just a quick brief history. Um, Lawyer Kun is my grandfather. He, he, uh, he's, uh, he's a real person. I don't know if uh, people actually grasp that, but it's actually a real individual. Um, I sat on his lab and everything. I'm, I'm the youngest of my generation as well, so uh, uh, we didn't really interact that much, but I, I definitely have a very clear memory of him. The uh, story goes that he, he came down to Hainan at 15 years old in 1926. Um, just a quick trivia about that actually is that um, Hainan Island is, uh, is one of the last to come to, to leave China. I mean, the Hainanese people, right? The, so you got your Teochew, your Hokkien, these guys, they left China way ahead before Hainan, the Hainanese did. So by the time the Hainanese got to Singapore, actually most of the good jobs were already taken. Good jobs being yet again, uh, a very subjective term, right? Because there were no really good jobs, actually. But um, uh, what, when they got here, they got the, 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 the scraps, the leftovers. And what were the leftovers, actually? They were food. They were actually food uh, industries, helping the British cook, helping in the kitchen, you know, not really even cook, you know, like clean up and chop and things like that. So, so that's, that's where you get your Hainanese cuisines and all the things, because most of the Hainanese were the last to leave Hainan and the last to arrive in Singapore. 
So same for my grandfather. Um, uh, he, he came at 15 years old. He started, he started, uh, being a shop assistant was not his first job. He did other jobs first, but he found that um, that, was the, that was the most viable for himself. Um, started a, a coffee store with two partners. Uh, Toyota Ai Basin. Toyota Ai Basin is your currently your MBFC and um, uh, uh, Marina Bay whole, whole area, which is obviously torn down. Um, but then also that uh, he, the two partners actually fell out. I mean, I think uh, by social reasons or they, they, they changed profession. So he actually took over the business himself um, and then ran the, sh ran the shop. And then from there, uh, we obviously jumped uh, many, many years, but the, the, the kickstart of the whole kind of professionalizing of the business started in 1998 when we relocated to Fry Square. Okay, so you obviously, I mean, the whole reason why you're here is because you know what your is now. All the gatos and coffee. Anybody can just make a wild guess why... How did this combination come about? This gatos, two eggs, and one coffee. I mean, this didn't spin out from the air, right? Like, how did this set come about? Anyone can make a wild guess? British, British close, but not exactly. Yeah, 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 okay. Fair enough, fair enough. It's British breakfast, but um, why, why did we, like, why did the, 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 the locals ad adopt that? Beg your pardon? Straits Chinese, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Easy to prepare, easy to eat also, right? Okay, okay, I'll just jump straight into it. Huh? Um, uh, Tolo Aya Basin, right, that's the clue. We, the first stores were, you know, catered to mainly the coolies. So coolies work whole, whole day, they can only afford two meals. Fair enough, right? So they had to have a breakfast and then they had to have a dinner. That was, that was all they could do. And in this, you have your protein, you have your carbohydrates and you have your coffee. So back then, that was enough to last the whole day. Now you can't even last to ten o'clock, right? But then, <laughs> but then back then you can you can go. Why charcoal grill? The truth of the matter was that charcoal grill because um, the bread was actually old, stale. Well, not always stale lah, but you know old and hard. So when you charcoal grill, you kind of mask the the toughness of it, and it's intentionally tough, right? Obviously not anymore today. Okay, we use fresh bread. It's delivered to us every day. But that was really the rationale. The bread was old, and so they wanted to make it, um, you know, just edible and delectable for, 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 for their customers. And actually, mainly really the coolies back then. Um, uh, 1998, uh, Fire Square, uh, Fire Square is, is still there today. Uh, we are the corner shop. Um, it was actually, a, 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 it was actually, back then, there was, 1998, there was no such thing as food street, you know, no underground, basement one of all the eateries put together. So somebody actually, curated that whole street. They wanted to put together famous hawkers to create that, that one street. And that was quite visionary back in 98, you know, you know what I mean? That was, that was forward thinking. Um, you know the wonton me at the end, it's also quite famous, but unfortunately along the way, the, some of the middle tenants actually left. So we are the ones who are from day one, and I think the wonton me has been there quite recently as well. So that is the story. And when we established in 98, we realized that um, you know, people were coming, they were liking it, they were queuing out the door, and that's when we kind of realized that, you know, a second outlet actually is viable, and then um, so on and so forth. So just a, a few pictorial um, uh, evidence, if you want to call it that, of uh, back then, that, that is Yakun himself. Um, uh, you can look at the prices and, and, and wish, but it will never happen again. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but these are real pictures of uh, my grandfather, and actually that one here is my auntie in the back. Right, so it's a really a very hands-on family uh, operation. All right, just quickly touch on this. Um, Yakun has five Ps as our mission. We strive to preserve its unique and rich heritage established since 1944. Uh, perpetuate its belief that a good toast can bind three things, kinship, friendship, and partnership. Kinship being families. Friendship being, um, you know, your, your, your friends just, you know, having a chat over coffee. And then partnership being business people meeting together to, have, to close deals over a cup of coffee. Uh, persevere in achieving his objective of uh, affordability and availability. Availability is still okay. Affordability is very difficult, right? You know, I know these days, but we are still trying to do that to the best we can. Uh, position itself as a forefront of innovation or product development. And, and now, I mean, when this was written, this was in 90-something. Uh, uh, product development is still a forefront, but now also service uh, in, a, in terms of digitalization. That's also part of, comes under that as well. And then uh, excellence and customer service. Uh, our values is uh, um, that Yakun has thrived as a business based on its focus of establishing a firm and friendly relations with its customers. That's our values. And um, 
special of all specials. This year is our 75th anniversary, so thought I'd share that with you. This, this is a newly launched sort of logo, but we are really proud because um, uh, we're very blessed to have come this far. Okay, I just talk a little bit about brand because brand does come into internationalization a bit. You really need to anchor your brand. You need to know what your brand is about before you go overseas. All right. So, um, uh, Yakun is the sole brand man uh, is 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 the sole brand managed by the company and has full resources and devoted to building the brand. Our company strategy, unlike um, others out there, which has no is is not wrong. It's just that our company strategy is reali we realize that we have a good brand. We have one brand, and we, it's our mission to deepen the brand and to grow the brand. So. We're not in the business of like you know acquiring or opening sub brands or different things like that. We, it's our mission, and it's no secret that we just want to grow one flag, you know, grow one flag, and to make sure that it's planted everywhere. I quickly touch a bit about branding. Um, uh, branding, you know, a brand, a brand is 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 one of those things that um, it's self fulfilling. So first, you need to anchor it, and uh, it needs to have the consistency throughout. And then once that that that, that is anchored. You will then reap the rewards over time, and I'll sh quickly show you that. Um, here we go. Yeah, so uh, branding challenges that we face on a daily basis about the definition. What is Yakun? It's very obvious in Singapore. Heritage, you know, the stools, the 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 tables, the menu. Some others they still shout. You know, it's fun to us. But when you go to overseas, let's say you go to Hong Kong and you do that, they're like big deal. You know, we also do that. So what's so special about you? Or if you go to uh, Myanmar or Indonesia, they don't do that, and that makes it even worse. How are you going to train the, the how are you going to train an Indonesian to shout? They just feel that it's very awkward, you know. So, so, so the definition of the brand has to then come down to what it really means. Is it the color? Is it the menu? Is it what we believe in? So, so along the way, we have um, we know where we stand, but then we then have to kind of buffer and and wiggle a little bit as we go to different different markets. Consistency, obviously, consistency is the challenge is to have every yakun look the same, feel the same, and taste the same every country you go to. Um, not so easy. Um, whether you go to other countries, we source some of the things we have to source locally. No point you go and send pepper from Singapore to, to China, right? They have pepper there as well. But it's the pepper, the same kind of pepper, the soy sauce, the eggs. You know, these things are these things uh, have are challenges in ensuring consistency. That being said, the kaya is all from Singapore. So wherever you go in around the world, if you find a, j a yakun jar, a, yakun, a jar of yakun kaya, it is from. Uh, the north side of Singapore is our own factory. We have one factory, and that is where we, we make the kaya. But beyond that, the coffee is also largely the same. The bread we try and source locally. No point we send bread overseas also. Um, but uh, that is a big, big challenge. All right. And then um, when you go overseas, in a in a sense of working with partners, uh, if they find a cheaper supplier, you know, then maybe they might go with that. But sometimes it's compromised too. So so that is a daily thing that we have to uh, engage communication. Um, uh, communicating the brand, bringing the brand forward. So, what what direction are we going? It used to be about heritage. Is heritage still relevant? You know, it, it still is. But we always ask ourselves that: um, Should we use technology? But how do we use technology? Is it is it uh, fun serving or back serving? Is it fun end or back end? Things like that. We just got to keep maintaining that kind of. Uh, these are the sort of questions we ask ourselves on a daily basis, um, pert pertaining to your own businesses and your own uh, uh, of. Sphere of, of influence to that is also something you probably will ask yourself. So why do I say that branding is so important? Because once your brand is clear and it is uh, anchored, then uh, the what we we'll call the fruits or maybe the rewards will then come in. And this is one of the one of the fun ones that we have have. I think everyone knows who this is, right? Uh, Hugh Jackman. He was a funny story. Real quick, I'll just sidetrack here. He he. This is this this was taken when he was in Singapore promoting the X Men Days of Future Past. Quite an old movie already, about about 2015 or 16. X Men Days of Future Past. So, uh, whenever he comes to Singapore, apparently he must eat gatos. It's like his favorite thing to eat uh, in Singapore. But he knows that uh, he'll be swamped. So um, he actually went to the shop. This is the Five Square shop. He went there at about ten o'clock quietly with a friend. All right. So he went there with a friend. Two of them, no fan fan, nothing. Just went out to eat and everything. So my 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 dear staff, my aunties, uh, they they had no idea who he is. They just <laughs> literally they just thought it was some random angmo. That's what they told me. Random angmo. <laughs> So when he was done, he knew that nobody recognized him, right? So he went to the kitchen, take a phone and snap a few pictures, then asked them to take a picture of him. So, so, so they took a picture of him, not knowing who he was. So maybe, maybe in person, he would look a bit different without the makeup. I have no idea, but they had no idea. And then uh, after he took the photo, um, he left. The moment he left, then he posted on Instagram. Okay, so, so, so a master of that. Huh? He left first, then he posted on Instagram, and obviously it went crazy. People were like, 
how come you didn't take his get his autograph? Why you didn't say anything? And then the, the the stuff literally was who is that? We don't know who is he. He's just some guy. Until they they compare him to Wolverine, uh, they put side by side. Then he's like then then they they kind of kick themselves uh, because they miss a golden opportunity. Um, but this is a true story, and I think this happened in about 2015. The next one I think you all should know this one is Charyan Fat, right? Uh, but he's more based in Singapore, lah. So you know it's 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 uh it's it's more common, but uh, then again, all the aunties, all they love him. Uh, so you can see how excited they are. Uh, this one was actually, uh, anyone can guess where this was? Okay, this shot was taken at like 7 o'clock in the morning or something like that. And you can see the line is so long, I cannot, my phone couldn't, this, I took this photograph, my phone frame couldn't capture. This is at the Trump Kim Summit. All right, when Trump Kim was in town, um, we were the only breakfast place and all the poor journalists were working through the night. So uh, they needed coffee. They don't care what kind of coffee, whether it's local or latte, whatever, right? They just... They just needed coffee. And so this was Trump Kim Summit. Um, and it was a very special moment for us because uh, we were very, very proud to be serving local coffee to everybody there. Yeah, just, just one or two more shots um, about that. So branding is, uh, branding is very critical and important to, to a company. I just, I just touched a little bit about some of the brand accolades. Uh, initially, when we started the business, we, we, we really tried to, to build upon that. But obviously, as time went on, we realized that you know, what is also e equally important is the mind share. Public mind share is equally important rather than you have all these plaques and this uh, and, and everything on your wall. So that's why we, we then kind of focus a lot more on the business as well. So yeah, some of the books and things. Um, okay, this, I want to show you this because this is the first step into our, inter this is the first uh, 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 image of our internationalization here. Um, back in Five Square, 98, huh? 98. So imagine no Facebook, no WhatsApp, no Instagram, nothing, right? 98, huh? it's good old Friendster and whatever you have, right? Um, we had this notice board, all right? We had this notice board. It's really a pinned up notice board with post-its. And we wanted people to leave their comments on a physical notice board with post-its. So um, you get people from, you know, around the world trying, Israel, Switzerland, Holland, they were pinning up. And of course, Singaporeans were also pinned up. And Singapore would pin up, Singaporeans would pin up, and back then, they also pin up their comments, right? Feedback, comments, complaints, whatever. So at night, right, my mother would actually go down and collect everything and then if it's a Singaporean complaint, she'll actually reply and you'll pin back the next day. And then the person, if so happened the person works in CBD, they saw their reply, they'll reply back. And so this went on for a little bit. It's actually kind of a fun story, but uh, obviously we, we, can't, we can't sustain that. But it was through this, this collage that we realized that um, the, the, the menu was acceptable. All right, People were, were receptive to the menu. They were not adverse to... To eating that maybe the eggs half boy we have a bit of issue but beyond that kind of coffee is okay um, and then uh, it was a destination point people coming from around the world regardless of the purpose of visit wanted to try our and that's when we realized that firstly um, the business could grow and then secondly we realized that we could also bring it up overseas as well all right uh, just a few things to touch on uh, our kaya is hala uh, but not the shops i mean you can ask me why later if you want but the kaya is hala that's why we can export it everywhere but not the shop itself. And then uh, we have, uh, we, uh, we, we really pursued some of the certifications like the HACCP and, um, and a few others to ensure that when we export, you know, it's of the excellent quality because we bear the Singapore brand, right? So you got your ISOs and everything to make sure that it is representative of Singapore in, in, in collaboration with Singapore. Okay, just quickly touch on this a little bit because I think we all are all familiar. Um, uh, to, to date, we have about 70 outlets, uh, Pushing a few more. Um, the, the most, the the newest one is actually at the Fullerton Bay. Um, that was just open about two weeks ago, and the next one that will be opening will be at Funan, which is still under construction as as we all pass by every day. And then, um, uh, okay, we are broken down into three concepts. Uh, this is this is something that uh, we we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, I thought I, was, I wanted to share that with you. Okay, we have three concepts: the coffee stock concept, which is what you are most familiar with is just called yakun, yaku gatos. Um, very small, 80 seats, high turnover, kind of uncomfortable chairs. Okay, that's, that's what you get, right? No secret there, yeah, okay. Um, uh, so, so predominantly, that's what you have. Then we have the, the kiosk concept. So the kiosk concept is purely takeaway. No, um, no seats. If there are seats, it's common seating. We are not the ones responsible to clear the, the, table, the, the plates. All right, it's it's just take away. So also you have it's only um, disposable uh, ware, you know, uh, uh, cups and, and plates and everything. It's only purely disposable. Um, obviously, the one you can see there is Takashimaya, and then the next one is actually the airport. So you have several at the airport, all built this way. 
more efficient, people don't really want to sit at the airport anyway, all right? So we, we work along that line. Bear pardon? Singapore Flyer is a uh, it's a kiosk concept, but actually it closed a few years back already. Yeah, 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 but Singapore Flyer is a, a kiosk concept. Um, and then the last one is a family cafe concept. All right, family cafe concept, we figured that uh, we have room to take a bigger outlet, we have room to, to serve main meals and to have, actually, so, so, so we opened our seating, you can see sofas, you know, uh, chairs with backrest, and we actually have a chef in every, um, in every family cafe where we, we want, we don't have a central kitchen, so it's not like we cook the paste and then you just pour out. We actually cook on the spot to ensure that you know there is there is some uniqueness to that as well. So there's a family cafe concept. So so basically three concepts um, spread across all all the yakun uh, outlets. And then the, the the newest one is actually this one. Uh, yeah, this one is uh, if you can see the logo is Shell. So we open one in collaboration with Shell, uh, where we um, uh, it is actually at the second checkpoint, second Tuas checkpoint, right? The second link. Um, right before you go on, uh, it's really popular. The truckers and those guys who, you know, 5 a.m. they need their coffee before they go out. This is this 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 is a wonderful location where we are working together with Shell. So it's not like um, they are land uh, they are renting us a spot. It's it's a very much of a collaboration. Uh, um, pretty new, I would say, and uh, we are looking to grow several. So if you see them along the way, that would be wonderful. Okay, quickly uh, about regionally, this. This image needs, uh, uh, I, I need to tweak because the numbers keep changing all the time, but basically in China, we are in six, six cities, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, Indonesia being our biggest outlet and also our longest. So uh, that is why it's also one of the largest. Um, I put South Korea down, not because we have any outlets there, but because we are, our kaya is being retailed there. So um, that's the only one that's kind of different where we, we don't actually have a physical store, but our kaya is, is, is retailed. Um, and the latest country that is, is not up to date, I'm so sorry, but the latest country is actually Malaysia. We just opened in Langkawi, um, if we are in May, yeah, about April, end of April. Uh, so Langkawi Airport will be the, the, the most recent outlet, uh, uh, the most recent country that we have opened as well. All right? Yeah. Okay, so I just want to, I just want to show you a few pictures about our overseas outlets. Just to get a grasp about it, and then uh, we will talk about that in a bit. Right? So this is actually China. Very rarely you see you know, this kind of setup in Singapore even, or flowers. Um, this one is in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, the opening of Hong Kong. This is in Thailand. So you get, you, you get a handle of like, the, the layout, and it's so essential to us that the uniform, the layout, the touch points are all very similar. Uh, Chengdu. Yeah, in all the outlets in China, if, you, if you're familiar with business in China, all the outlets are big. There's no like small outlets. So, so we really had to tweak our, our menu and our strategy when we went there as well. Um, Indonesia, Indonesia's, uh, in my opinion, Indonesia's taste buds are most similar to Singaporeans. Um, even sim more similar than, than Hong Kong, I would say. So that's why Indonesia was easy to grow. It was easy to grow quickly as well. They, they were very receptive to the brand. Uh, Yangon, uh, Myanmar. The first one in uh, Myanmar, Myanmar. Um, this is when we set up there with uh, with, uh, with with the locals, Philippines, um, and Langkawi. All right. So this is the Malaysian one. Um, uh, very very proud and happy to to be a foothold in Malaysia as well. Right. So that was one of the questions I always get. Why do we when do we open in Malaysia? Now nobody can ask that because we actually did. Uh, but there's a reason why we talk so long. So. Okay, I didn't want to show you all our success stories, so this is one of the picture of, uh, of one of the countries that we opened but closed. All right, can anyone guess? Want to just make a wild guess through the picture? Uh, where what country this is? Just a wild wild guess. Taiwan? Uh, no, no, no. South Korea? No, also. Okay, maybe maybe I go closer. I uh, know no, this this picture doesn't help. Um, anyone can guess. Okay, maybe this one will be a lot easier. All right, you can see the Arabic. Uh, it's Dubai. All right, we opened in Dubai. Um, we had a very good partner who was very enthusiastic and was a, a, a very strong partner. I, 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 yeah, without saying too much, he was a very strong, steady partner. Um, so we tried in Dubai. I think the, the, the lessons I learned was firstly that um, uh, the Dubai, the, 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 the Arabs, their eating habits are radically different from us because of the weather and things. Right? Lunch is at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And then dinner is at 9 p.m. 
true story, all right? So, so it's just very, very different from us. They like their teas clear. Excuse me, they like their tea clear. No milk, ginger tea, uh, red dates tea, you know, things like that. We must add milk. So it's a very, very different. You cannot just build a business selling kopi o. You know what I mean? It's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And then also, um, we, we realized that uh, the locals didn't actually go out very often. Their houses were very big. They had, they had uh, helpers at home. You know, they had land. So there was no urgency to go out and shop. This is my, this is my analysis, post-mortem analysis, all right? Anyway, so I could be wrong, but this is our analysis. So after, after, after opening one outlet, I think we, we were there for about two years. We decided, you know, it, we are not ready, and neither is the market ready. So we decided to close the outlet. So I wanted to show you one reality uh, 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 story about how not all succeed, but we still try anyway. Um, okay, this one is Hainan. Um, I just, yeah, Hainan is very important to us because we are from Hainan. So, uh, the, 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 the story is that after 75 years, we made one full circle and went back to Hainan to open, all right? So that is, uh, that is the opening of Hainan. Uh, quickly, the next one is so similar. And then I like to show you this one because where on earth you find a lion dance in the order, you know, in, in, in your face, really. So, so this is Hainan Outlet. Um, uh, we are opening, we have two now, and we are very glad because it, to us, it's a major milestone of making a full circle back. Okay, I just want to quickly touch, since I'm here, a, a little bit about um, the Beer Papa franchise because that's one of the things that we also acquired. Um, the Beer Papa franchise is just a franchise. We do not actually own the brand. We did not start the brand. It's from the Japanese company. Uh, it opened in 14 April, uh, 14 April 2015 where we figured that uh, the, there was a lot of synergy both in a menu type but also in the company values. We, we met them, we realized that they, they, they emphasize a lot on freshness, you know, pure ingredients and things like that. So, so we figured that um, it, would be a, it would be a very synergistic partnership. Uh, this is the opening of our first outlet. Um, and yeah, quickly, yeah. And then uh, um, to date we have about eight, out we have nine outlets in Singapore. Uh, it's just a step for us. It's a learning process for us. We do, and we do enjoy the, the process as well, but uh, you won't see some of the beer papa stand alone, and some of them they, they 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 sit side by side to a yakun as well. This is one of the initial flavors that we tried. You know, kaya cream puff using our own kaya. Um, yeah. Okay. Quickly. Uh, now we talk a little bit about um, digitalization and some of the challenges that we have. Uh, in our in our thought process, we figured that um, tech is here to stay, but not all tech is for everyone. All right. So so. Our challenge was to figure out what tech is useful to us and our customers. So I will not bore you with the back-end tech because that is like HR systems, accounting systems. Obviously, everybody needs that and everybody strives to achieve the state of the art. But I want to share with you is a little bit about our front end. All right? And obviously, the cashier goes through a lot of um, training and new technology, new appliances. I would say I wouldn't say technology because a lot of them are still mechanical. But we developed an app that is a sort of a, what we call a thank you. So the app is called, is coined Cherish because we wanted to cherish the customers. All through the years, right, people will be coming to us to say, hey, we really want a loyalty, loyalty card. You know, we come to Yakun once, two, sometimes even three times a day. How come no loyalty card? So we figured, firstly, why not we do the easy link kind, you know, where you know you have your, your tap, you, know, you get points, 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 points. But then I also figured that in, in two years' time, the easy link will, will be phased out, right? And, and we can see that now too. So uh, we jumped from stamp card to EasyLink. We figured that EasyLink was not appropriate. So we actually went ahead and did the, the, um, the app. So the app was established on uh, uh, one year ago, uh, almost to, to date, 2nd May last year. And to date, we have about over 100,000 downloads and, and rapidly uh, rapid usage every day to, uh, to collect points. But OK, so it serves three purposes. The first one is to um, cashless payment. All right, so the first one is as a form of cashless payment uh, where you just put in your credit card and then it just, it just goes through. The second one is a reward system, a loyalty point system. You collect, you get your free coffee and things like that. And the last one, in, in time to come, will be an order ahead system. Nothing new in the industry, I must confess. It's nothing new. But for, for us, as a local coffee chain, as a, as a, as a, as a, a, a coffee chain in, that is commonplace, it's a big deal. I, I hope you understand the, the how, how big a step it was for us because it's not new. Of course, you've got pizza places, you've got Western Coffee who does all that. But for us to, to challenge to do that, to challenge our team to do that, to challenge my operations guys who have been with us for 15 years, my uncle who has been doing this for, 60, for 30 years, to do something like that, it was a, ma it was a major, major step. Um, so I'll just yeah, talk about modernization, right? Like, 
I, I found this picture very apt because it's the challenge between old and new. Uh, the app has limitless potential, but a lot of teething problems, all right? And, and it's not because the tech is not ready, but it's, it's both front end and back end, and I'll touch on that a little bit as well. Uh, uh, just to show you a little bit about how we launch the app, how we push, how we, how we train people to use the app, because uh, so, so the, the, the idea was this. Uh, when, when, when I started to, when I started to, when I started work about, you know, eight, eight over years ago, we all had to go through this like on the job training. So there's no way that our executives or, or, or our managers, right, like make decisions from the office without having a sense on the ground. So everybody has to go through at least one or two weeks in the outlet, right? Hands on, you feel the heat, you feel how to toast the bread, you burn your hand, you cut your hand, things like that. Okay, so you got to go through everything. So when I did it, I did it at Fais Plaza. Anyone familiar with Fais Plaza? Yeah. The Yakun? Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Fais Plaza is such that, right, the Yakun is tucked away in the, in the, in the corner, and then you have to make this like, long, awkward walk of about 50 meters to the Yakun counter, okay? So uh, no matter where you go, you kind of have to make the L shape and you have to make a long, awkward walk. So I, that was where I was trained. And so um, you, you get your regulars. Your regulars will come and, and, and order. And the regulars come so frequently that when they turn the corner, the staff will start to make the coffee. Already. They know what they want. Every day, the same time, the same order, right? Can be, and it's, if it's peculiar, it's even more memorable, like kopi o siuta, you know, something very, very peculiar. It's very, it's very common. And then there's no, there's no verbal, there's no verbal, um, there's no verbal communication. They just go up there, they leave the money, they take and they walk off. People are tired in the morning, you know, 7.50, people are tired, we understand, no problem. So, um, so I was like, wow, this is fascinating. And I mean, it's eight, years, I mean, eight years ago, so I was very fascinated. That's amazing, you know. Then, uh, then, then my staff saying, yeah, my trainer said, yeah, this is amazing, but I tell you what's even better. Uh, you're familiar with Fire Square? The Fire Square outlet? Okay, so Fire Square is, is literally in front of a street. There's just, it's like the shop is here and then there's a big street here. All right? You say that, you think this is amazing? My, your uncle, my, my uncle is even better. He said that when he's at the shop brewing coffee, their car passed by, he already started to make their coffee already. <laughs> so, so, so he remembers their order to that kind of point. But my point is this, we, I took these two stories to build the app. So my whole point was that the app was also meant to serve as sort of a, a, a interactionless transaction. Not that we, we want to minimize human interaction. I think human interaction is important, but timely also. So in the morning, you know, you don't want to fumble with your coins. You don't want to ask the auntie, well, nets, well, well, ticket, well, knuckle. You just, you just want to get, get it over and done with. Come back later and talk to them. Come back later and say hi. So we, I use these two stories to pitch how to build the app. And, and as, as you taste it, as you, you experiment with the app, which I will let you to do in a bit, um, you will then understand how it works. Okay, so uh, um, this is the app, and I actually created it for you. Right, so to give you a simulation of what real life is like, if you can download the app, right, I appreciate all of you making your time to come out here. I just want to talk about key challenges quickly because digitalization affects all of us. Uh, how I break it down is there are three challenges, top down, bottom up, and then ground up. Top down being our uh, management's perspective. Right, so when we were looking at it, we were always thinking about how, uh, what brings the brand forward, what are things that we, because there's a full suite out there. And of course, if you have the money to pay, you can buy, buy, buy the sky and the moon. But do we need that really? And will the customer need that as well? So the top-down perspective on the, the, the positioning and whether it's relevant and useful is, is very important. The bottom-up approach was the, the uh, customers. So as you, if you do try the app, you will realize that there is actually no QR code to scan. Um, there is, it is literally, you know, you put your profile number, uh, your profile picture and a number, and then the cashier will actually see your number and, and or profile picture sometimes, and it's just, just done. So the market, when, I, when we implemented it, we realized that the market was not ready for such. Um, they always wanted, eh, is it enough? Is it done? You know, there's things like that. So we actually realized that we also have to take into account our own customer's profile as well. I mean, that's something that we knew, but um, our customer's profile did not range from the, I mean, range from highly tech savvy, to some also tech naive as well. So we were concerned about that. And the last one actually, um, the last one is actually about the ground up. And when I say ground up, I actually really mean my staff. So my staff, um, wonderful people, wonderful uncles and aunties who, who, who man the shop, who man the shop from 6.30 in the morning. It's not easy for them. Now, I have to be very clear about this though. I think there's a, they are uh, poor, poor uncles and aunties are a bit maligned here sometimes. They are, it is not that they don't accept technology. It's not that they cannot. But when, you are when you're standing there and your queue is like eight or nine people and you have cash, 
Nets, Visa, credit card, app, and, and whatever, you know, vouch, uh, uh, mall voucher to, to, to go through, and then each one is a separate step, anybody will be blur. Right? Make sense? So, so it doesn't have to be because, oh, you are, you are not so tech savvy. They use Facebook, they use WhatsApp, they are fantastic at that. It's, but, but you have eight, nine options, and poor person will also be like, you know, what, what, what is it you want? I mean, they, they'll, they'll, they'll get stuck for a little bit and they get, they get hindered. Not to mention, and we're not even talking combination. Some people say, I got voucher, the rest I want to use this, the rest I want to use that, I want to pay cash first, then I want to do that. So, so you get all these permutations. That's what's really difficult. All right? Um, but, so I can say that the app has no, uh, the, the, the staff has adopted the app. My staff has adopted the app really well. They are fantastic cr uh, crew. Um, but it takes time, it takes patience, and it takes a rehearsal. A lot of rehearsal with them as well. Uh, okay, so just a few more pictures, uh, a few more you know, uh, illustrations on that. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I'm going to be very happy to take questions. I just wanted to show you this picture because this is done at our 60, um, 68th anniversary Thanksgiving dinner. And these are all, we invited all our staff who are 65 years and above to go onto stage. And we really thank them. And you can see there are about 70 of them on stage. They're all 65 and above. So these are my staff. These are the ones that we really think about every day. You know, they're the ones who are carrying the, the flag and the fort. Um, and, and, but they have adopted technology. They've adopted change fantastically well. Uh, we always honor them at, at, the end of, uh, at, at our dinner every year. So this is, this is just to kind of put a frame of things. So yeah, I've come to the, quick, the end of the presentation because I want the buffer time for questions. Uh, happy to take any. You can cover the whole spectrum up to franchising as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi. So yeah, um, so I have a question. I just want to check with you, like all of your stores. I'm sure some of them are franchise, especially mm -hmm. the regional um, outlets. Mm -hmm. So I'm just want to know: is there like a really, in your opinion, like a balance of how many percent like the company should own and versus like how many should be franchise, so that we can manage the brand properly? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, there is no magic number. Um, for Yakun's Yakun's story, is that uh, it's about fifty fifty. All right, but the, the, it's, a, it's an internal company uh, secret that we don't actually tell people which are franchise and which are not. Actually, that's a, that's a legacy thing because in the past, uh, before franchising is really, really widespread, um, a lot of locals, they were like, don't go to the franchise, right? You know how it is like franchise has this connotation. They want to go to the low, they want to go to corporate, but not, not anymore, but we just continue this, this, uh, this trend just, just to also prove to our franchisees that uh, they are part of us. We won't throw them under the bus. Everyone, is, as long as you bear the name of Yakun, it's all us. But that being said, just about all outside of Singapore are franchised, and that's a known fact. All right? So out of uh, all the other countries are franchised, except Hong Kong. Hong Kong is corporate-owned. The rest are all franchised. So to answer your question directly, there is no magic number. Of course, you need a critical mass. I believe that you, once you have a critical mass, you can then cover your HR, your operations, you know, and then you can run your own shops to prove and show how things go. Sometimes we guinea pig on our own shops. We don't guinea pig on the franchise shops because you know, there's risk there. So we, we test some of the things on our own shop first. Successful, we then roll out further. A bad one? Like, how do you get your franchisees, um, people, I mean, people who own the franchise, mm. um, to actually use adopt. the app? How, okay, how to yeah. get them to adopt the app? Uh, it, was a mixture, okay, it was a mixture of a few rounds. We actually sat down to talk to them first. But to sell, you had to really sell the idea. And, uh, but actually, you back up even further, right? The... the the, the, actually, the question is that how do we... It, it comes down to actually franchisee selection. So we go all the way back. We, in our franchisee selection, we really selected partners who are prepared to work with us, who understand the framework that, uh, look, we are happy to have you on board, but we have been doing this for years, 15 years, 20 years. So trust us. We won't throw you under the bus, but trust us when we make decisions that may, may temporarily hurt you on your bottom line. You know, things like that, right? And then if they are willing to come on board with that kind of correct mindset that it's not all about profit, but we're here for the long haul, six years, 12 years kind of, of franchise agreements, then they come, Then we will choose them. So it's that kind of setting the, the groundwork, right? Setting the, the, the start point correctly. Um, so when we roll out things, um, obviously the, the app was one of the biggest change, but um, they all accepted it. And they, they knew. They knew that we had thought through everything first and thought through it well. So that was actually yeah, that was a that was a good exercise. Yes. 
Uh, thank you, Jasher, for sharing the exciting story and last year's story of Yakun. So I'd like to just perhaps uh, have two questions pertaining to what's happening in China. Because I understand you have eight outlets in China right now, with two being open in Hainan. Uh, and I just like understand your uh, original strategy for that for China because uh, I think part and parcel of uh, internationalization, internationalization is localization of taste. And you mentioned as well just now uh, in terms of shifting taste buds to mm. suit the, the, the taste preferences of local customers. So uh, because I, I like to bring up a point because uh, I have Chinese friends who have tried the Kaya mm. and not all of them have, uh, you know, they have a, an appreciation for the, okay. the sweet coconut taste. Uh, and I understand that there are also regional differences across China. So uh, perhaps I would just like to understand how would you, uh, would, would you be able to share uh, whether, how has the menu been adjusted to suit uh, different, the, the consumers in different parts of China? And also uh, another thing about operating in China is the, now they have a new retail strategy where a lot of it is through food delivery apps. Yeah. So I would understand whether Yakun has also embarked on this process as well. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, okay, just to quickly touch again, uh, we are in, um, we don't have eight outlets, we have 16, 16 or 17 outlets, but we are in eight cities. I think that's the, that's the thing. But okay, anyway, that's that's immaterial. The the your question is about taste buds and varying taste buds. I think that also not just China, but in, in a lot of a lot of places, it's it's uh, varying. We are not dogmatic. Okay, there are some things we are dogmatic about. Kaya being one of them. Coffee. We don't want to compromise too much, uh, because anyway, com coffee can be tweaked. Right, you can add more, you can add less, so that's fine. All right, um, and uh, the kaiatos should still stay true to the kaiatos. All right, so uh, before before all this franchising in China, we actually opened in Shanghai, corporate. So we, we we ran it ourselves, we did it ourselves. We learned a lot. It was very tough. We lost money, and then we actually closed the shop first. Then we opened again in the rest. Now, Chengdu, Shenzhen, all these countries, they're all franchised. So to tie in, they're all franchised countries. So uh, in China, we don't we don't sell um, a master franchise to one person. We sell city franchise because it's just more man manageable, bite sized, and we help them to grow. So um, whenever we set up a country, we set up a, a city, whether it's anywhere in Vietnam, everywhere. The, the strategy is always that we will send our guys there. Be okay, before that, prior they will come to Singapore first, get a kind of feel of the grounds, kind of understand the brand. We'll bring them a tour. Maybe they also try their hand. But all of them are business people, so they're not actually hands on. Then once we are ready, we will go over there. Now, shipping kaya to China or any country is not difficult. Uh, shipping coffee is also not difficult. The the ones that are trickier is that we don't want to. We will source locally for bread. So bread is the one that we have to taste, and then uh, eggs, so on and so forth. So, so when we do that, uh, we ensure the taste profile. Whether or not the locals take take to that is another question. All right. Um, however, that being said, we want to stay true when it comes to the set A. In terms of other food food items, your laksa, your even we sell chicken rice over there. Okay, we sell chicken rice, um, and a few other varieties. We know that they really really hate uh, mie rebus. I of course are uh, peanut paste. Uh, yeah, so so they don't they don't do that one. But the rest we actually do. Um, and then on top of that, we give them the liberty to introduce two uh, local dishes. So we really have mala, okay? We do have um, one or two there. We have some things that are more salty and more sweet. But we let them do that to, to just attract the local passerbys, the local crowd, the local business market. But beyond that, we also want to maintain some sort of brand and integrity with that. Uh, on top of, sorry, sorry, real quick. Uh, the, the question about the app, develop, uh, the delivery, right? Yeah. Um, when it comes to business development, our relationship with our, our franchises is such that we will only deal with um, opening and marketing. So in, some, in, in terms of app develop, um, in terms of uh, uh, delivery, we let, we, we, it's, free, it's, free, it's free hand for them. If they feel that the market is ready, they have room to go, they can do that. If not, uh, it's still up to them. So we don't force, we don't, we don't, we don't restrict. I see somebody here? Yes, thank you, hi. Uh, hi, uh, I'm, hello, uh, I'm JJ from, uh, currently working in a food tech startup. I have uh, two questions for sure. you. Uh, the first one is, um, what worries you most uh, these days? Like, um, what keeps you up at night? Is it uh, in terms of running a business? Is it the manpower or digitalization, operations, operational workflow? Um, then the second question is, uh, speaking of uh, improving a business, um, for how, when you're on a research mode, where do you uh, look out for information? Do you just Google it or like you talk to people or you attend events? 
uh, how do you uh, research on how to improve your business? Yeah. Which space are you on most? Mm. Yeah, that's all. Okay, uh, thank you. Maybe the first question first. Um, okay, there, 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 are two, there are two answers to the first question, and I say that tongue in cheek in a little bit, but you hope you understand what I mean. I do sleep well at night, okay? Because, <laughs> no, no, because I have a very good team. I must say that we have a very, very good team. So um, we have a CEO, we have a CFO. They're not family members. They're professionals, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, my operations guys uh, have been with us 15 years. Some of them are with us 15 years, all the way to, um, you know, they saw me uh, uh, when I graduated. And things like that. So, so they are a fantastic team. They are the ones who will be the first call. If there's a fire, a robbery, you know, uh, staff never made it home, which happens, which happens, I get reports like that. They are the first ones who will go down. They will drive down to the house to knock on the door. Why are you not home? Things like that. So they are a fantastic team. They enable me to sleep at night. But okay, so, that, so that's, that's tongue in cheek, but I really must credit them. But what worries me a lot is um, a sustainability also. Because uh, what successes, what were the successes past five years or 10 years, so even for us 15 years, does not mean that it's exactly the same moving forward. Absolutely not. You know, how we build our brand on heritage, how we build our business on this simple menu can be wiped off very quickly. So, so it's, it's a lot about uh, staying with, uh, understanding trends, not chasing trends, just understanding them. It's about um, understanding your business and understanding cust what customers want. But then knowing how, how deep you need to be rooted so that you are still true, but, you don't get, you, but you're not immovable. So I won't, I won't one day wake up and turn into a bubble tea. Eh? Not, nothing about bubble tea, but I won't turn, up, turn into a bubble tea, be, even though that's a trend. But I cannot be like, what, deeply rooted in, 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 in kopi, kop, like kopi katai, you know, when the trend is that siu thai is, is better, less sugar is always better, you know what I mean? So to know your business, but to be able to kind of wiggle a little bit is, is, is what's important. Now, how do you wiggle and how much do you wiggle? That's what keeps me awake. Okay, so yeah. And then, that, that goes into your next question, which is... Um, What's the next question? Uh, uh, oh, what are, yeah. To me, right, the research is the best research is from the staff. The frontline staff can tell you everything that no, no analysis can do. You talk to them, Auntie, Nike, my pizza, how? They straight away they tell you, oh, this is not good, don't take it, take away, it's hard. No, these, these beat whatever analysis that we have, whatever uh, 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 charts and Excel sheets we need, we need, because they tell you the truth and they will not, they will not, they will not mask it for you sometimes. So um, going down to the ground, talking to them, actually is very, very beneficial for me. I put, a, I put aside half the day to always do that. To just go down and chit chat. And then also you look at the customers. Ah. If they don't finish the food, right, you know what they don't like. Right? Or is it too much? Or is it too, you know? You walk, you walk around a busy outlet, you can see what's left. Right? You know, okay, this is, this is what's going on. So that's what I do. Um, I mean, of course, you do your, re your usual research and your reading. But uh, yeah, the, the, the shot is that I find very, very uh, informative to engage the operations team. All right, thank you. Uh, we have time for one final question. Do we have anyone with burning question? I can take one or two, it's okay. No problem. Sorry, I, I do have a question. Sure, yeah. yeah hi, um, you know, it's very hard to hire frontline staff, mm. especially in Singapore, mm. because the labor cost is, is there mm. for any retail outlets. So I actually go to Yakun very often, and actually it's very surprising to see very happy staff working at the front line. Okay, thank you. So I'm very, very surprised because usually they either start or they just get unhappy, you know, sure. in other outlets. So I just want to check with you, like, how do you manage and motivate your frontline staff and then at the same time manage the professional top management? Because mm. obviously they are very two different groups. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay, just to answer the question, the, the, just to, to take it a step back first, it is not, not so much that there is a labor crunch but in my perspective, there is a huge influx of F and B, uh, uh, and B retail. All right, so so the pool is still there, and um, uh, the workers are still are still you know abundant and they are working. But it's that there's a massive influx of new brands and new concepts and, and new 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 shops sprouting around um, that that makes it that makes this circle very competitive in hiring because everyone's comparing, you know, and they're always like trying to figure out. Uh, which is better and things like that. Uh, I, our, in our line of business too, and I'm glad that you, you experienced that. I'm very happy to hear that because um, it is really, really not easy. You know? they, they have to wake up at 5 plus just to go down, set up about a full solid hour before 
the first one at seven thirty. So I always uh, I, I I do I do engage. It's a personal personal uh, uh, job of mine. I I take it upon myself to engage customers who complain. Because I want to try to win Singaporeans one customer at a time. It's not easy when you go down, you want your coffee at 7.30, you are late and everything, right? you're, you're, you're kanchong. But the poor auntie has been there one and a half hour before. And then uh, um, they, they, you know, so I'm trying to just try and help people to understand that they see it from their perspective too. It's really, it's not easy. Um, a lot of it is uh, teamwork. They, they actually enjoy working because of their colleagues and the manager. So, so how we help them is that we try to form a team that works well together, gels. So if it's a dysfunctional team, right, they won't like each other. Then you complain, then they quarrel, you know, then we have to reset the team again. But it's about man management. So the, the manager knows the, the personality and of, of each person. And then so even when we hire a new interviewee or something like that, uh, they will know but just this person character like that one, uh, you know, they maybe got some pattern, right? Uh, they'll, they'll put it to this outlet. You know, this person is okay, you know, very happy go lucky, they put it to this outlet. So it's about knowing your, your shops integrally. And then they also know your customers. So they know that is it Topayo Hub? I'm sorry uh, if you come from any of these places. Topayo Hub has a particular demographic. Alright? And then uh uh Baru has a particular demographic and depending on the certain time. So they also know how to manage and how to train the I mean forewarn them that this group is going to be very uh, picky, you know, and this group is going to be very slow, you know, and things like that. So, so kind of know the, the, the region you're at. Um, and then uh, you, you go further up uh, when, we when, I, when, when we interview for even uh, management staff or executives in the office. Uh, um, Singapore, hard skills, not hard to find. I think everybody has some relevant experience and when we get applicants, you know, everyone has some relevant experience. It's about finding the right person to meet the team, to join, to merge into this culture. And so some, I, I'm very honest with interviews. I say, look, if you are, over, you are super ambitious, good for you. <laughs> but Yakut may not be the place because we are sort of a family. You know, we want to go back at 6.30. Means you want to go back at 6.30. Please don't stay back because the person who will look after you will be very unhappy. You know, that kind of thing. Um, we are not overly ambitious. We want to value uh, balance. We, we want to value uh, community, not so much about... Uh, rising and you know, you know, all that stuff. So uh, it's about finding the right fit. Um, not it doesn't work all the time, uh, but we really, really try to build a team. Uh. And uh, the team is also built around the family values. So um, thankfully, the 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 family values are, are evident, and that's how we just kind of build around that. Okay, maybe yeah, we have time for one last one. Hi. Yeah. Can I just ask what is the most difficult thing when branding for the region? Because each market is so different. Absolutely sure. Uh, so the the there are many difficult things. All right. I think j the the one of the things that sticks out is this thing called shared heritage, which I I, I call shared heritage. We grew up with this sort of uh, a kopitiam style, right? Kopitiam, you know, kopitiam prices, right? Kopitiam menu. But when you take it overseas, uh, where do you fit? Where do you fit? Because you don't have the shared heritage with them. Myanmar, Cambodia. Don't share your heritage. Hong Kong shares your heritage, but it's still there right now. It's not. It's not. It hasn't run ahead that much, you know. And then obviously China has actually run way ahead. So selling them stools and things, they will not like. They will. They will, they will look down on you in a sense that that you know you're undervaluing. And then we cannot go there and sell coffee for three fifty, four dollars, four fifty because we are. I'll be realistic. We're not a brand that can command that kind of price. Four fifty for Kopio, right? We are not there. And then if they travel, they know. Hey, in Singapore, one eighty. How come you come to my country and sell? Four dollars US. Okay, so we have to be realistic. So the, the biggest challenge is finding your place in each market. Where do you slot in that is just right that they are willing to try as an alternative to what they already have? So a lot of countries it could be Starbucks. A lot of countries it could be Cha Chan Tang. You know, uh, uh, um, Nai Cha. Right. Uh, where do you slot in as an alternative? Um, still delicious. Still something worth worth trying and something you you are prepared to go back several times. So generally, um, outside of Singapore, we, we price slightly higher, maybe $2, $2.20. Um, not too high that it's exorbitant, but uh, realistic to, to match expectations there. So that was always the thing that like, it can be a hit and miss. And if it's a miss, you give it one or two years, suddenly our price will change, right? or our strategy will change, because we know that um, we made a mistake. Uh, um, yeah. But generally, we, we do market survey first, and then you, you talk to people, you get a sense on the ground. Then you kind of understand where you position. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.